Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm in Ballard Canyon in the San Ynez Valley with Peter Stoltman of Stoltman Vineyards. Uh, Peter's the general manager, second generation. Peter, tell us a little bit about Stoltman. Yeah, uh, my dad, Tom, uh, was looking for limestone throughout the Central Coast. Uh, He knew about our outcropping in Ballard Canyon. Uh, It finally uh, went up for sale in 1988. He was able to buy it in 1990. There were no vineyards in Ballard Canyon at in Ballard Canyon at the time. so he took the shotgun approach, planted 18 different varietals, wow. and Syrah was the immediate big hit. Um, so today we have 100, 175 acres planted. Half of that is Syrah, and the other half is our 14 different varietals. Uh, so 15 varietals total, a lot going on. We make about 35 different wines a year, <laughs> uh, spread out over three different brands, Stoltman, the classic wines, and then we have another brand, So Fresh. I'm actually wearing the hat right now. Yes, you are. Um, and So Fresh is all about carbonic fermentation. Um, so in Santa Barbara County, we have amazing sun intensity, uh, long growing season, very compact winter, uh, a lot of flavor concentration. Um, We don't irrigate our vineyard, especially in a vintage like 2023 where we got plenty of rain. 80% of the vineyard, all the mature vines will be dry farmed. Uh, So we have these tiny grapes packed with flavor. We figured out that if we don't crush the fruit, we leave the grapes whole, aka carbonic fermentation. Uh Um, We can make dynamic, delicious, chillable uh, wine. So, Super fresh wine. So fresh. <laughs> so, fresh. Um, so half of our production actually is the, the Carbonic really? So Fresh brand. And then we have a tiny little side project with a gentleman named Raj Parr uh, called Colm. And that, those are just crazy wines like Trousseau and Chenin Blanc and Mondeuse. Now you said you have um, 18 or 17 different varieties. Or now, sorry, you're down to 16. But are they all Rhone varieties? Uh, no. So the, the Rhone varietals for Syrah the lion's share. Uh, Roussan is our main passion for the white. We also have a little bit of Viognier and then uh, Grenache and Mouvedre. At mm-hmm. one point, Dad had Cunha and Sinso. Uh, we oh, no longer God. have those two. Oh. Yeah, so we <laughs> we like mushroomed up to 18 varietals in the late 90s um, and then we cut it way back and focused. And then with the comb lines, but, like we have our first vintage of Sauvignon coming out right now. Wow. Uh, so Jurassic varietals have been added through comb. So we've kind of Kind of, it's like an hourglass shape. 18, then we leaned in, really focused on the Rhone Vrattles. Of course, San Giovese is our Italian <laughs> project. Um, and then and then with, with Colm, the Jurassic Vrattles, Mondeuse from Savoie, we've gotten a little, a, a little carried away again. A little geeky there. Um, what's your total case production? So from the estate, we average between 25000 to 30000 And then uh, my partner, Ruben, our vineyard manager, has planted uh, more Sangiovese, uh, more Grenache for, for the SoFresh brand. Um, so we do a little more than just the estate. And I'm sorry, the 25000 includes the SoFresh? So the 25000 to thirty from the estate. Uh-huh. And then SoFresh, um, we do a total like fifty five to sixty. Okay. Thousand, yeah. Wow. Wow. So you're buying some fruit. <laughs> well, you know, it's a hybrid okay. uh, because Ruben is a vineyard manager, a partner in uh, the premier vineyard management company here in Santa Barbara County. Um, so depending on the particular vineyard, uh, we might be buying per ton or we might have a 10 year lease or a 30 year lease. But the beauty of having Ruben as a partner uh-huh. is that we can plant these vineyards. We can figure out the vine density, the clonal material, the row orientation. And put whatever weird grape you want in. <laughs> right. Um, so the only difference is we don't actually buy the land, which is nice is when dad bought the land in 1990, Ballard Canyon was not wine country. Right. Um, there were a few cows, you know, dotted oak trees, uh, you know, golden brush the golden state um, now of course Santa Barbara County like we're no longer the underdog you right. know when I travel to Europe um, I think Santa Barbara County is the best represented American region um, 
in Europe. Wow. You know, all the Michelin star restaurants have, you know, Saint de Hill's Pinot Noir, um, wow. of course, Stoltman wines. Um, That's very cool. So your wines are available around the world and in different markets? Yeah, I counted recently. We're in about 18 countries. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Go, go Ballard Canyon. <laughs> well, the cool- go Santa Barbara. Yeah, go, go Santa Barbara. <laughs> you know. uh, the coolest, my favorite market um, is France. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it's cool. It's cool to start exporting to the UK and Germany and then, of course, Scandinavia. But when our wines landed in Paris, you know, we had an expression growing up in Southern California. Why would you take your girlfriend to Vegas? That's like bringing sand to the beach. Uh-huh. You know, there are already beautiful women there. <laughs> and, uh, very chauvinistic. We were teenagers. Um, but, I mean, talk about bringing sand to the beach. Yeah. Like, selling California wine to the French. That was just like a great pat on the back. That and they even, like it. it. <laughs> yeah, and they keep reordering. It's amazing. So, and how many acres total do you own? Um, so the ranch is 218 acres and we have 175 planted. Okay, so fair amount. A fair amount. So, um, you were obviously younger when your dad bought the property. I'm wondering, um, even prior to that or how young you were, what's your first, your first memory relevant to wine? Just having, my dad always loved the big like Barolo bulbs and just having those big crystal glasses on the dinner table. (laughs) Um, Especially if we had company over, there'd be two or three for every adult. Um, And I just remember a little dining room uh, growing up and just, you know, a lot of stemware. And of course, sticking my little head pretty much in that that (laughs) big bulb. Um, And, you know, everything smelled like white wine or red wine. Um, And then as a teenager, I started really picking up nuance and um, yeah, getting wow. getting more and more into it. So as you got more and more into it, is there one wine that stands out as one of those aha moment wines in the beginning of a career or maybe more recently, I don't know, an aha moment wine? You know, the my biggest aha moment, um, I had a few as a teenager, but um, I'd gone back from making wine abroad and I'd gotten a job at Henry, Henry Wine Group, a uh-huh. distributor here in, in California, and uh, met my wife there. And um, I would go do my laundry on Tuesday nights up at mom and dad's and have family dinner. And on one such night, Jess tagged along. I don't think I brought my dirty laundry at that time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so Jess, Jessica, my girlfriend at the time, not my wife, and dad uh, would always let me pick out bottles from his cellar. And you know, we're you know, she'd never been in the cellar, so we're going around and showing showing her. And um, she, oh my God, look at all this Sinequinon. And Sinequinon, of course, <laughs> is this amazing cult, like big, rich, hedonistic. Um, uh, Santa Barbara, really the only true cult winery in Santa Barbara. Right. Um, and I said, oh yeah, back when um, Dad sold grapes to Manfred Crankle, the owner hit a deal that for every ton he sold, he'd get a six pack of wine. Oh, and we're wow. talking like these bottles are worth thousands of dollars at that point. <laughs> and you know, I I hadn't been that into him. I was more on like a old world kick, you know, really working to refine my palate. We were representing Kermit Lynch and all these amazing import uh, portfolios. And I'm like, yeah, we should try one. Like, I don't think she'd ever had one. And we picked up- I've never had one. So it was the 1997 white wine called uh, Twisted and Bent, I believe. And it was Roussan dominated with like 40% Chardonnay. And it was just about 10 years old and it blew my mind. I'd never had a white wine that rich, that intense, that coating. Um, And the irony is, I don't think it was like a direct uh, catalyst for now making a 70% Roussan, 30% Chard <laughs> from the state we call it uni after our local delicacy or ur- delicacy urchin. Uh-huh. Um, but I put that together like, wow, maybe like in the back of my mind, it has to be in the very, right. very back recesses in your subconscious. Right. And it was really just, I, you know, we, in the, the following year, I think my dad had like nine or ten of them. We drank the, all, all of them, and I've never had that vintage again. Uh, but then my buddy Clark, um, he, he owns a, a, a restaurant called Full of Life Flatbread. Uh-huh. Manfred and, and his wife Lane um, frequent the restaurant, and um, Manfred gave Clark a bottle of his current release of white, and he shared it with us. And oh, wow. it was not quite the aha moment. It didn't have the bottle age, uh-huh. but like, it, it just goes to show, like, very low yielding 
uh, Rhone white, uh, you know, it's particularly Roussan, then with the acidity of Chardonnay, it's a, it's a magical thing. Wow. So obviously you live in wine country, you work in wine, you make wine, uh, you get to drink a lot of good wine, clearly, as you just expressed, <laughs> wines that most people don't get. But I'm curious, in your home, um, in your wine cellar, in your office, on the floor, under a desk, in a wine refrigerator, what kind of wines do we find in your home? Is it a lot of domestic wines? Is it international? Are there particular grapes that you te- tend to drink more of personally? We are on a big white burgundy kick. Huh. Um, and no, no appellation in particular. Um, like Marceau, you know, anything. Um, Bourgogne Blanc. Um, but especially in the summertime, like, I just love white burgundy. Um, yeah. It's just, you know, before dinner, while we're cooking. Um, but, and I'm actually overdue for placing a couple case order uh, <laughs> from the source. We've wiped out, uh, you know, I only have, I think, red bottles right now. Oh, and, wow. And so, like, all my drinking wine, it's in my home office, and then I keep all my collector wine um, up at Dad's cellar, um, up on top of the hill in the vineyard. And what's um, in your collections? What kind of wines? So typically all Northern Rhone, um, uh-huh. but then I've gotten deeper and deeper into Barolo ah. um, because I figured out I can collect my favorite Northern Rhone wines to the quantity I want to for my boys. So Augie was born in 2017 and Otto was born in 2019. I love the 19 vintage worldwide. 17 was a little more challenging, uh-huh. um, but I figured out there are great values still, not just like Nebula d'Alba, but Barolo. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I what I'll do, I'll go through and buy a mixed case, figure out what I love, and then buy um, buy the case and hopefully, you know, I love Rolo 20 years old, so 25 years old, so hopefully both of my boys will appreciate what I'm wow. doing for them. If not, you will. Right. <laughs> so those you're laying down for time, but is there anything you drank recently that drank really well? Mm, I mean, my favorite producer probably across the board is uh, Gonan from St. Joseph. Uh-huh. Uh, 2013 and 16 right now are both both stellar. Um, I just had a breathtaking Merceau from a producer uh, brought into California by uh, Ted Vance of The Source. And I'm, I took a photo. I'm drawing a blank on the name. <laughs> but yeah, that was over the weekend. Wow. So. wow. so you're working with a lot of different grapes and obviously have fallen in love with a lot of different varieties. Do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? No. And <laughs> I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect wine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I like to talk about like chasing dragons. Um, like if, like for me, like with our Rusam program, uh-huh. um, I'll always be chasing the dragon of not Sinequinon, but Jean Louis Chauve, uh, Hermitage Blanc. Um, you know, just and I still won't like. I'll never forget having it out of Magnum at about 22 years of age, and it was like amber in color, Ooh. and but still had freshness and just so coating and just the, the texture was just like addic- <laughs> addicting. Um, but I wouldn't call that wine perfect. Like it, it was just so delicious and wonderful and perplexing and thought provoking. Um, but to me, like perfection, that's not part of wine. Like, right? Like, mm-hmm. cause I think of trying to perfect something and that to me, like takes you down the rabbit hole of manipulation. And I think the beauty of wine is that every vintage is to be different. Mm-hmm. You know, vines are gonna get older. Hopefully, the wines are better in bottle um, or more captivating. Um, right. Uh, but yeah, to me, like the word "perfect" that's part of the fun of our artisanal in- industry. Like, you know. Is there perfect painting? Like, you know, like <laughs> no, but because there's 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 beauty in it all. But right. but this idea of chasing the dragon. I mean, obviously, you know, there are brands out there who will chase scores. Um, I know that's that's not how you guys make wine, but a lot of people do follow scores and and try to seek out wines that are these, you know, high scoring wines. What's your opinion on wine critics and scores and how they play a role for you? I think, I, I, re- I remember the wine advocate arriving at our house, you know, at a, I forget if it came out like bi-monthly or whenever, and my dad would, you know, read through it, and that was pre-internet, yeah. right? And it, and in the beginning, Parker, um, my dad felt like his, his palate 
aligned with them and he yeah. trusted them. Um, Parker then evolved and got r r richer and richer and oakier um, and, and higher octane. And my dad realized, okay, I don't like the wines that he likes anymore. Um, but if you do find someone that you align with, that's great. Um, there are a few critics that are rewarding that riper high octane style mm -hmm. still. Um, and I've asked them, you know, about it and, and you know, their base suggests is like, listen, like I've like defined my palette, what I'm giving 99, 100 points and my readership now knows that. They and if, that. if they're on board, they're gonna buy what I give those huh. huge ratings to. Um, and I said, okay, like well, I'm just gonna cruise in that <laughs> 95 point realm um, and know that I'm really not gonna break out of that. Um, and you know, it's just fun for me to, mm -hmm. to get reviewed um, and just to, you know, <laughs> everybody in the game, they're, they're sharp and it's yeah. just interesting to sit down with them. Galoni in particular is always a fascinating sit. He said some things that, that have stuck with me, um, others that I joke about, like he told me once, why do you take up your beautiful Syrah terroir with Sanchevesi? Why do you waste it? <laughs> and I'm like, all right, note to self, I'm never showing Galoni Sanchevesi again, but I'll never forget, like he, I showed him a barrel sample of a wine we call The Great Places, Ruben Solorzano, after my partner Ruben. Uh -huh. And he said, when are you bottling this? I said, oh, like after harvest. And he said, why? I'm like, well, you know, we want to give it plenty of oak age, plenty of integration. What will get better by waiting? Like, <laughs> and because he loved the wine. Yeah. I'm like, you know, you're right. Like, why are we waiting? Um, and it's so funny, I heard myself say the same thing uh, to Guillaume Monnier in, in saint Joseph. Uh, we were trying the 18 vintage in 2019. I'm like, when are you going to bottle it? So we always bottle after harvest. I'm like, what? Why? It tastes <laughs> like, so good now. Damn, damn it, Glenny, you're, rub <laughs> you're rubbing off on me. Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, and I don't buy wine on points. Right. But, you know, like, it, it's fun to get a huge review. And it's fun to, like, break out of that 95 point threshold and be like, wow, okay, like you thought that vintage was like it, like you get it. Like, you know, like a vintage like the 2020 vintage where we had a record breaking heat wave on Labor Day. We didn't have fires down here, uh -huh. uh, but we had that same heat wave that was driving those fires out of control. Um, and I, I mean, first year of COVID, um, trying to figure out how we're gonna make wine in the era of COVID. And then we get this enormous heat wave where at the very least we knew it was, gonna, it was going to compact our harvest. Right. You know, like everything was sitting accelerated in ripeness. Well, the wines turned out breathtaking. I love them, even though they're a little riper, a little richer than, than normal. Uh, but it was just, it was kind of, it was reassuring about the critics to see everything get bumped, like two or three points. Like, I'm like okay, yeah, they, they <laughs> like the richer riper style. Are yeah. they gonna get that in 19 or 21? No. No. So like I know like okay like, that was one year where you know we hit it out of the park and yeah sure like you know our, uh, some of our collectors to pay attention bought the wine a few retail shops you know begged for allocations and you know and that, okay that that was that was fun and let's move on to the next year. So so if you okay you you know if you were to you don't go on scores and you were talking about a couple um, great wines you had that were white wines but as a consumer. If you had to choose, red, white, or rosé? <laughs> I want to say white, but I have to stick to red. Like, yeah. I mean, it, like white today. <laughs> but I'm overall red. red. And it's really funny that you bring up rosé. Like, I'm, I, I haven't been drinking much rosé probably for the past decade. Um, but I've, I have a very serious addiction to children. And again, that go, goes back to her So yeah. Fresh brand. I mean, carbonic reds you can drink cold just like rosé they have more texture they have more dynamic flavor um so as far as like getting high on my own supply um i chilled red i, know, <laughs> I do a lot of chilled red whether it's grenache gamay trousseau or colm trousseau or like all, yeah. all the different wines that we're making that that is what i gravitate to and it's what we cook too right well speaking of cooking how do you approach food and wine pairing um is it a, just about a really fun fresh red wine and it goes with anything or do you follow any rules or guidelines you're right the fresh wines go with everything, whether it's like Thai, <laughs> easy, easy. Thai Vietnamese, Latin. Um, you know, we all think about only Riesling for for spice, but I love chilled red with, huh. with spice. Um, so yeah, the fresh wines are no brainer. Uh, of course, like you know, I have a 
guilty pleasure that I love caviar and having some like rich, decadent white wine. I don't really do champagne and caviar. Uh, what? I mean, I will. <laughs> I, I, I won't say no if you offer it to me. But at home, like I'd rather do a richer, more tactile white with than that salty, rich caviar. Um, but yeah, there's a, to me there's a progression. Like if you're really going to eat and drink well, like you know, it start for me. It usually starts white, goes to chilled red, and then if we are doing red meat, then you're doing real red wine. Real red. Um, so yeah, I'd love to be a vegetarian. I don't know if it's going to be in the cards. <laughs> We don't eat a lot of red meat, and it's like we never cook red meat at home unless we're having people over. Right. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it, it, I know one Syrah winemaker who's a vegetarian. I'm like, wow. Like, and you do wine dinners? A lot of portobello like, yeah. mushrooms. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, um, for someone who hasn't had the pleasure to taste Stoltman wines yet, and obviously you're making a couple different style wines, but what do you think they're missing out on? Um, the, the beauty of what my dad was seeking out and what he found. Uh, Limestone shells, right? Shelled sea creatures, aquatic creatures, um, you know, over a million million years, um, between two and three million years ago. um, We were a freshwater estuary, the shells piled up. Um, Now we're, you know, 700 to 1100 feet above sea level. Um, Shells don't have acidity. So anything you grow on shells will be the opposite. And that's so important for California, and in particular, particular, it's a great privilege in Santa Barbara. California, we get plenty of sunshine, that long growing season. So classically, what we aim to deliver is delicious coating um, textures, but then with freshness, with liveliness, and not just for So Fresh, but for all of our wines, like the, we're, I think that's my number one obsession. I want like the the profile of a taut, uh, perfectly ripe grape, mm-hmm. not a baggy, drooping, sagging, overly ripe grape. Right. And the limestone really that that acidity that enable that the limestone enables really helps us to to deliver that. So again, like coating hedonism, but fresh and alive. Oh. So if space aliens were to land on your property right now, which of your wines would you welcome them with to say, welcome to Stoltman? I'd have to impress them, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, to me, our most collectible wine um, is uh, The Great Places August James Stoltman, named after my elder son, who in turn is named after August Klopp out of Cornas. Um, it's just a two-acre block. Um, 12,000 vines in those two acres are really really tight together. It takes 10 vines to make one bottle of wine. The pre-clonal Syrah material was so low, it is today so low yielding. We get barely any fruit, tiny clusters, um, but just amazing depth. Um, And and that block includes the mother vine uh, program. It's the only mother vine that we know of in the world um, where we took one special pre-clonal cutting and uh-huh. rather than, and by the way, the, ma- the majority of our vineyard is own rooted, uh-huh. um, wow. but, and this particular block is too. Um, so we own rooted this special cutting and then rather than cutting the growth again and replanting adjacent, we trenched the growth underground and pointing back up. Oh, how so we cool. kept the three daughters in the next generation connected. And then we did that again, nine granddaughters and then 18 great granddaughters. So we're up to 950 interconnected vine heads, all one vine. Um, so if aliens come oh, in like cool. 15 years, I'll be able to give them a bottle of the mother vine. So the goal is to make a few hundred bottles from one vine. How cool. One vine being with lots of daughters. Yeah, in and out, in and out of the ground. And yes, yeah, like, like apparently Domain Romney Conti was only like Romain, com, Rom, <laughs> Domain Romney Conti, the actual parcel uh, was only like four or five interconnected vines through something like the 1945 vintage. And it finally wow. succumbed to old age or phylloxera and they ripped it out and replanted on rootstock and apparently the wine was never the same. So there is wow. a benchmark for this. Wow, wow. Well, so you've, uh, how old were you when you came up to this area when your dad bought the property? So the journey began when I was four or five, uh, okay. when my dad was up here looking for, for vineyard land. Um, he bought a 1987 red Jeep Cherokee, so he could four by four out on different you know parcels to check it out, dig holes, look for white rock. 
And um, so it's a big adventure growing up in Southern California to be bouncing around the hillsides with that, meeting cowboys. And, um, <laughs> so I loved it. You've yeah. really been here from the start. You've been here from the very beginning. You've watched it grow up and grow the vineyard alongside of you. And I'm curious, you mentioned earlier, you know, we have um, some vintage variation. Um, how much do you see varying year to year? How much commonality do you see or have you seen um, in your vineyards? We certainly, every year we have like the Stoltman terroir stamp um, where, you know, you know it's a Stoltman wine, just like everything I was talking about, what limestone does, the freshness with the richness. Um, but I do take great pride in vintage variation um, because it's proof that we are picking at, you know, the appropriate ripeness. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you're waiting to pick raisins every year, you lose that that vintage variation right you know and you can do that in Santa Barbara and most places in California you can get the fruit that ripe without mold or mildew um, but then you lose that year-to-year -year variation that that stamp of the of the vintage um, but I would say that we don't have as much vintage variation as you'll find in in almost any region in Europe right. um, where you know you just have more kind of swings in, in different directions and you know wet year drought year our only variation with rain is how much we get during the winter because we never get it during, <laughs> during the growing season that's uh, true that's true so when i worked in italy like it it rained a couple days every week i'm like oh my god the one vintage i'm working in italy it's getting rained out it's you know i'm never gonna drink and the they looked at you like that happens all well, the no. time and then, and then yeah and then it was, it was a stellar vintage and i'm like oh okay yeah <laughs> we're just spoiled in california well so are there any signs or predictors you look for that are going to tell you what a vintage will be uh, I mean they're every every step of the way so how much rain are we getting uh, when do we get our first warm days when it, when there too is bud break if it's really early are we gonna have frost um, so you know, one step leads to another right, right but you can't jump four steps ahead no and then and then as, as you get into you know June and July then you start looking at the long-term forecast the Pacific Ocean temperature how how much heat are we gonna get how intense will it be um, and then are we gonna have time then for everything to even out to have an even march to, to ripeness and you know and then who knows what nature will <laughs> yeah. throw at us new. yeah so so no real predictors there <laughs> i mean guides but nothing well, just, okay, no like, guarantees so in june or july like you, now the question is are we gonna have heat or not right and then the other variable if we don't get the heat okay are we gonna have a very late year are the vines gonna have the energy to continue to ripen um into well into november um and that's a big you know like 2021 was a very late vintage without any significant heat waves and so then that became the concern like all right come on guys <laughs> just a little more a little so more. do you ever go into the into the vineyard and talk to your vines to encourage them along or reprimand them uh, we don't um <laughs> it's more touchy-feely you know just seeing how how dry the leaves are and um and you know of course you know shoot thinning and, <laughs> and shoot positioning uh i'll never forget ruben the the funniest thing he's ever said on on that side of things is um when his son omar was a a, a baby um you know it had been it, we hadn't gotten much uh winter rain and uh he told me one morning you know because Ruben lives surrounded by all the vines uh, in a beautiful little hamlet within the vineyard. And uh, he said, you know, all the vines are screaming at me. <laughs> Luckily, Omar screams louder. <laughs> well, see, the vineyard manager does talk to the vines. See? <laughs> the vines talk to him, apparently. That's true. <laughs> but if he's listening, he responds, right? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you established any sort of uh, good luck rituals or traditions with the winery to kick off harvest or at any point during uh, harvest? Just making sure we drink a lot of good wine. Uh, we do. We, Which you do every day, right? right? Well, we do have a tradition. We um, we we blind taste one bottle at lunch um, throughout vintage. Um, it's fun. You're drinking wine, but it really like it gets us to actually think and talk about the wine, um, and it limits the consumption because then we have to go back to work and we don't want injuries. So just you know, one little blind tasting. We usually have 12 people there, so one bottle. You're like, yeah, it's just a taste. But um, that, that that would be our one tradition. But I've never thought of it in terms of bringing good luck. But. I think we would be afraid to halt it because yeah. then what would happen? Right, yeah, <laughs> don't jinx it. I mean, it may 
it is good. It, it's something. It's like the same, you know, not shaving or wearing a t same t-shirt or something during harvest. Um, you know, you started out in wine uh, growing up around it at a young age, and it sounds like you worked harvest other places and you worked for uh, an importer and selling wine. Um, you, was wine something you decided at a young age you wanted to get into, or, or was there something else you wanted to do? I fell in love with it, um, just coming up and falling in love with the beauty and, and just the rolling hills and the freedom, uh, riding the ATV around <laughs> when I was far too young, driving the Jeep around when I was far too young. Um, but my dad always like, you know, kind of didn't, he never pushed me into it. And then he also, you know, like you don't get into wine to like make real living. Like if you want to make money, you need to, to go out and, you know, do something else. <laughs> and so that, you know, so he, my dad encouraged me to keep my options open, to get good grades, to go to a good college. So I went back east uh, to Georgetown. Um, I actually came back to LA for my real job where I was going to make money, um, but I hated it. And I was, What industry was it? I was a sales manager at an industrial supply company. Okay. Not very captivating, <laughs> but it was really cool. It, it, I had to grow up real quick. You know, I was managing people, you know, and um, it was very, very good for me. Um, but I was bored. I didn't want to be my boss in 20 years. So I didn't want to go get an, an MBA. And um, in, the, in the meantime, my dad really needed someone to run the company. And, uh, and I told him, that, hey, like, yeah, you know, I know you wanted me to go off and make a lot of money and, you know, be prosperous. But he also harped on, like, you need to do something that you're passionate about it. You need to be fulfilled. And I think I'd be fulfilled, you know, being a steward of this beautiful place and making sure that I can carry it on for you. And it worked out. That's awesome. So when you're not working, how do you spend your free time? What do you like to do? <laughs> I have a, Run around uh, after two little boys. Right. Yeah, I have, a, I have a frightful lack of fun hobbies right now. <laughs> <laughs> the mountain bike has been hanging in the garage for months without being used. Um, I'm passionate about surfing, um, but I love to, to travel to surf. And mm -hmm. that's a great excuse to get on a plane and go someplace tropical and beautiful. And uh, my little boys are getting into surfing too. But yeah, like it, it, any free moment is just family time and dad time. And it's just so much fun to see the joy and the new things in their eyes. And we actually took them to, to Italy last year. Oh, nice. And they're such good little travelers. They love it. Um, we don't have any big trips this year. And they're starting to ask, when are we going to go on an airplane again? Like, <laughs> it's good. You just teach them. They're going to surf, they'll mountain bike, and travel with you. Perfect. Well, not a bad life. <laughs> not a bad life. Lucky little kids. So when you put them to bed and you're planning a romantic evening for you and your wife, um, since you're both from the wine industry and you both know a lot about wines, what kind of wines set a romantic tone? Romantic tone. Um, I think A high, special night. High-end champagne. Um, to me, like... There's something, you know, it, it's so funny, like, one downside of blind tasting is like I actually get upset when I realize that it's a really expensive bottle uh, that we're blind tasting. Because so you're like didn't picking fully it apart, you're like, I want to like, okay, like, wow, that was a hundred dollar bottle. Like, I wanted to actually just enjoy the pleasure of that, and so there, it's really interesting, like that association of like how dear the wine is as far as monetary uh, versus how much enjoyment. But there is something, you know, even though like you know, Jess doesn't care about, you know fancy things, but there's something really special about popping open a Solos with just you and your, <laughs> and your partner, yeah. and like, okay, this is a really special, we can only afford a couple of these a year, um, and then to do that one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, just, we don't want to share this with our other friends, yeah, this is just makes... for, this is a moment for you and I, you know? <laughs> That makes perfect sense. So, um, when you look back at your achievements to date, in work, not because your family, of course, is going to be your first answer to this. But what would you say is one of your proudest achievements to date? Um, you know, when when I took over, it was in the middle of the 2009 recession. Our bank had opted not to renew our credit lines. We there too were in default for a year and a half. Um, and just now that we are healthy, that that you know we've we're, we've done so much work in the vineyard. Um, Certified organic. This year we're certified. Um, we finally uh, got certified to meet our biodynamic. Wow. Um, but you know, we were talking about how much wine we make, um, and we're not a tiny operation. 
Um, but the really cool scale that we've reached is that we are small enough to do everything by hand, to control everything, to have small ferments, uh, touch our vines 14 times a year, um, employ 34 full-time workers in the vineyard. Um, but then we're big enough where we can have red wines that are 24, 25 bucks. Uh, Rosé is a little more affordable. Not every bottle out the door needs to be $50, $100. Um, and it's just really cool to watch our wines sell. You know, I don't have to travel anymore for, for promotion. I get to stay home with the family. Um, and, you know, we're no longer worried every pay roll. Like, are, we, are, we, are, the, are the checks going to bounce? And it's just beautiful that, like, you know, we're always worried about the economy. And, you know, but, um, you know, we have a, an amazing group of collectors, our wine club. And, um, you know, it's, it's really cool to sit back with my dad and, and look at, you know, how far we've come and to feel confident that one day I'll be able to hand over the reins to perhaps one of my, my sons. Not obligatory though, right? No. <laughs> I learned that from dad, yeah. That's awesome. That's really beautiful. So is there a piece of advice that um, someone gave you, maybe it was your dad or maybe a teacher, mentor, or a friend, um, that you try to live by or work by, something that, that you've always kind of carried with you? I think it wasn't per se advice, but I think just knowing Ruben my whole life, um, I learned early on that he only respected people once he saw like how willing they were to work hard and not necessarily how hard they worked. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and I think he's always appreciated work-life balance and family time. Um, but, you know, seeing how hard Ruben worked and, you know, he's a first generation, you know, he's an immigrant. He is the American dream in one generation. Um, his willingness to, to get it done and, you know, you know, he was ambitious, but he, you know, he worked his way up from field hand to now like the grape whisperer, you know, <laughs> known worldwide for being a vineyard on, um, you know, I think that really like, you know, it, 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 it feels really good to, yeah, I'm an entitled second generation wine brat, brat but Ruben respects me because he saw how hard I worked and how willing I was to do what it takes to, you know, get the, the winery successful and, and make sure that we do everything right, that we don't cut corners. Um, so when I figured out that I had earned Ruben's respect, I'm like, okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> so like a silent advice, work hard. Yeah, I like that. So imagine a scenario, we're sitting at a table, um, there are bottles of Stoltman wine on the table and there's an empty seat next to you. So who from any walk of life, living or deceased, imaginary or real, would you want to share a bottle of Stoltman wine with? Bill Murray. <laughs> I like how quick that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Okay. Why Bill Murray? I mean, I just love everything about him. <laughs> like, I mean, he just seems like one of the most fun humans on the planet. You know, just I'm sure we would have we would be cracking up the entire evening and you know just having a blast. Yeah, making Caddyshack references or something. <laughs> well, no, I just, like, I, you know, like I think I've watched documentaries about him mm -hmm. and just like you know him Pretty showing cool. up to house parties and just you know being, <laughs> being a joy and um yeah obviously it's hilarious so how fun okay um complete the sentence for me a table without wine is like boring <laughs> can i say that yes of course you can say it there's no right answer there's no wrong answer i should say um okay i have a um we play a little game this is a great way to talk about your wines since we haven't, we've spoken a little bit about them and I just, um, you know, wine soundtrack, we pair wine with music, have a little fun. It can be a genre, it can be a song, it can be an artist, don't stress. But um, based on some of the wines that you've spoken about and then also, you know, some of the other wines you make. Let's see, um, I wanna start with, let's see, Carbonic with one of your So Fresh wines. Let's see, Carbonic. Did you, did you say you have a trousseau? Yeah. Yeah. Grenache gave me a trousseau, uh, Beyonce, all the way. <laughs> wow. And why is that? Um, it's just happy, dancey, great rhythm, just, you know, 
you want to stand up and you know maybe not you don't have to dance but yeah. you're like you know kind of move into the beat I like and it. it's just like a happy joyful one um what about the stoltman Ruson? Ooh, that's it's serious but beautiful um You know what, I'm gonna go... Hmm. <laughs> a stumper. <laughs> the Rue song, I think that's... Because my mind's going in. It's just, you know, like, let's say like Ryan Bingham. Like, just really cool, but yet like deep and soulful and um, just tells an amazing story. Like that's like root song just like goes on and on. Like there's so many layers. So I love it. Um, and the Stoltman Syrah. <laughs> Cause like I feel like the Syrah, like I have to be mature about this and like talk about like a timeless artist. Not a guilty pleasure. Um, why not a guilty pleasure? Because it's not, like Syrah, <laughs> Syrah isn't a guilty pleasure. Right. Like you really have to like work for it. You have to like learn to appreciate it. But I don't really listen to music like that. <laughs> <laughs> like it'd be like Mozart or something. But that would be like I'd be a fraud if I wasn't. <laughs> um, the Syrah. You'll edit out the sounds. Sure. <laughs> um, God, that. Now I'm thinking like British sophistication going down that path. Hmm. British yeah. sophistication, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so complex. Um, yeah, okay. I just have to, like, it's so timeless and age-worthy, um, but beautiful. I mean, I just have to, like, default to the Beatles. Yeah. Why not? Timeless, age-worthy. Right. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So, um, I have another question for you. You talked about a lot of delicious wines that you've drunk, and I'm wondering if you had to go to a deserted island, what three wines you would have to, well, you, you would pick to take with you of all these wines that you've had. Okay, so we've we've talked about quite a few of them. I think um, um, Jacques Delos in the Shawl Champagne. Not, nothing, not the fancy one, <laughs> just the Nichelle. That's so humble um, of you. <laughs> I'll go on. Um, old, old, like let's go with like 1990 Jean Louis Chauve from Touch Blanc. Um, probably, but on an island you don't need red wine, right? I assume it's a tropical island. It's any anywhere. Um, <laughs> And then um, let's do like the perfect Terry Alamond Chaillot Cornos. Ooh, love it, love it. So um, last part, mm. you're almost oh oh. I wait. just held the wine perfect, like a, a stellar vintage. I, I, uh-huh. I lambasted associating <laughs> perfection with wine, and here I am calling Terry Alamond Chaillot perfect, but stunning. Uh, it's perfect for a deserted island. There you go. The perfect <laughs> Time and place. Yeah. <laughs> so. Last question. This has been so much fun listening to you and hearing all your stories. But my last question is, you took your boys to Italy last year. And I'm wondering um, whether you take them or not, what wine region in the world is at the top of your bucket list? You know, I really want to take the boys to South Africa. And, um, you know, yeah, you know, fly into Cape Town and uh, just venture out and... Um, you know, enjoy. Like I, I was, I went to South Africa when I was about twenty, uh-huh. and we backpacked for a month. And just the, the stunning raw beauty is really what's like calling me back there. Plus, some really good wine. Yeah, <laughs> some good Chenin Blanc. <laughs> voilà. And um, last part is, if people want to come visit you, come taste Stoltman wines. Where can they find Stoltman? How, what can they experience here in the San Ynez Valley? 
Yeah, so we have a beautiful little tasting room in the town of Los Olivos, which is just the most bucolic little pleasant town with the flagpole in the middle. Um, we have the classic patio for just, you know, the traditional Syrah, Roussan, Sangiovese. And then next door, we have the fresh garage. So all the carbonic wines, different soundtrack, uh, really fun, more Beyonce vibe uh, than the little bit more, uh, you know, <laughs> Well, it's still laid back, but yeah. a little fancier um, classic patio. So they're right in downtown Los Olivos, and we have amazing restaurants in Los Olivos and throughout the valley, um, great hotels. We're like, all of a sudden, we're like, I think the like restaurant and hotel culture has caught up to the wine culture. Um, so yeah, I mean, to me, it's just the perfect spot to, to come visit on, on a wine and food trip. And of course, the raw beauty. A little different than South Africa, but right. just to like... Yes, but but one bucket list is someone yeah. else's, you know, regular. This uh, could be I... someone's bucket list. They should. I mean, San Inez Valley is an amazing place to discover. And Los Olivos is such a charming town. Um, so you get to taste the estate fruit. You get the so fresh. I mean, you just get a whole selection of wines from Stoltman. So, Peter, thank you for joining us today. It's been really fun chatting with you. And let's go taste some wine. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.